Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, this is Scott Fischetti from GeoPath. Just want to welcome everybody and say thank you for joining today's session. I'm here with Brian Schopper, who's popped up on the screen as well, as always. Hey, everyone. Hi. And I uh, just want to, again, say thank you to everybody and just a couple of quick housekeeping things before you jump into it. You know, as always, feel free to ask questions. We'll do our best to, to answer as many of them as we can. Um, you know, we'll we'll try to answer some of them in the moment. Others may, we may just kind of do at the end, um, just depending on the number and, and just how the, the flow of the session is going. And um, also, I know a question we often get asked is like, will this session be recorded and where can I watch it later? So yes, it'll be recorded and it will, oh, it will be at our Geek Out library as well as in our Geek Out portion of our, our website. And I'll actually have a couple of slides coming up that I'll show you where you can access this. Um, so today's session um, is gonna be very similar to the one we did on the 23rd, but a little bit more high level because we wanted to be able to spend a little bit more time today. Um, just one scene, additional questions might have come up since the release on the 27th, try to answer some of those questions. We know through our geek out some questions that have been coming up and we'll try to address, address them here. Um, and also just to give a little bit more time to showing everybody how to use the forecast. So how do you access this data uh, through our tools? Um, but also we will we'll cover again at a high level, just some of the things, like I said, we talked about in the last session. So understanding some of the, the, the background, what went on in the background to create this forecast, um, talk about the reach of frequency model, how that's improved and what to expect from that and then talk about the release of transit uh, station media and scheduled fleet in terms of you know, what's changed and why that matters. Again, this first time in a while, obviously we've had that type of inventory in our system. And so we're super excited about it and really want to be able to, to make sure our members are feeling comfortable with this inventory. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, feel free to check out. Um, we have a, a host of support materials, hopefully, They've been helpful for everyone. Uh, they were released, I think, on the 23rd. Yep, is actually when we put them into the Geek Out library. So they're available there. And there's, there's a host of different things. So there's a FAQ document that's a pretty substantial FAQ document. That could be your kind of uh, one-stop shop that drives you to other places for, for the rest of the information. But there's a host of, of FAQs there. And again, that'll be something, we'll, it'll be a living document. So as we get questions, maybe even on this session or over the coming weeks that, about it, if we don't have a, uh, if, it, if it's not a question in the FAQ, but multiple people are asking, we'll probably put that in there and we'll update it and you'll see version versioning of it uh, as we go through. But we also have a host of, of one pages related to the recent frequency improvements. Um, the uh, fleet and transit, our approach to measurement, as well as kind of our what changed and why it matters. I know these these types of the what changed and why it matters are really helpful as you're talking with clients and some of these new things are introduced. So hopefully those are there. And then we also have a, a, a set of user guides and video tutorials kind of, they go along with each other. One's kind of a, a, a printed version that you can have side by side as you're, as you're going through and trying to figure out how to do some of the stuff. And then there's the video tutorials all available in our Geek Out library. And all of this is downloadable in, in a single folder as well, if you want it. Uh, and, and again, hopefully they've been helpful. And if, you, if, you, if there's any improvements as you've been using them, definitely feel free to show us, uh, email us at Geek Out, where we want to make sure everybody's feeling comfortable with this release as we go along. Um, also, the, the webinar, I mentioned it a couple of times already, I believe. The, the February 23rd webinar is available. It's in our Geek Out. If you go to our website and click Geek Out and scroll down to our out of home office hours, it's the first one sitting there in that position. I have a red box around it. On that session, uh, Dylan Maben, was, Dylan, our president, was on there as well as uh, Cheryl Zimmerman from Lamar and Glynis Riley from Horizon, both our co chairs for the Insights Committee, and we're really helpful in helping us kind of get through the last handful of months. So anyway, just to get start to dive into it. So the evolution of the 2023 forecast. So our forecast obviously is it's one of our key deliverables and it's one of the it's inherent in our purpose as an organization. Right. And this year in particular was really interesting, right? Because 
obviously we, we had come through COVID, the heat of the pandemic in 2020 and in 2021, we were starting to get back on track. And so this is the really the, the first forecast since we've gone through all that and where we have a much more stable data source that we can use. And that was really important for us. So this is the first time period, right, since COVID that we've been able to have a full year of observed data from, again, it says here, obviously, September 21st through August 22nd. And why, why that's a good thing is, again, it, it's a, it provides a, a more stable data set. So the data set becomes less susceptible to, to short-term things like the pandemic, which, again, you know, the, the, the big dip you see in that orange period was was pretty short term, but again, recovering from that has been has been a long period. Um, one thing about this chart on the right, if you if you were at the last webinar, this is actually a slightly different chart, and there's something interesting about this I want to talk about. So that 2022 line, so we we have our observed data, but we're always looking towards other data sources as sources of ground truth to compare, right? Things like gasoline consumption or Federal Highway Safety data. Um, and this chart in particular, the Federal Highway Safety uh, Administration has restated 2022. And um, you, the line has actually come down a little bit. So you can see we're, 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 we're starting to track um, a little bit more closely, um, not quite even there yet at the end of the year with for the pre-COVID era. And 2021 was actually a little bit higher. So um, so this actually, um, again, could start to explain and see why maybe you're, you might be seeing some changes and why some of the metrics might differ in the 2023 forecast, right? So just to take one step back and just really talk about what is the forecast and how is it built and, and what do we do, right? So this first bullet, right? And it may be obvious, but but I want to just restate it. So th the forecast reflects local traffic activity, so pedestrian and vehicular activity on roadways. And again, that can view the audit and inventory. And that's, again, if any of you have interacted with Kevin Romero or anybody on his team, that's what his team is work, works on, right? They're looking at all the inventory that comes in, audit, auditing it, and assign, making those assignments. So that's essentially what we're doing. And that's what the, this data kind of informs that, that local traffic activity. And again, given that this year where we have the first full year of the data, we're able to look at that year over year and compare that. Again, helping create a more stable forecast. The other thing that's again may be playing into why metrics may be different for some, some inventory is that the breach model has been vastly improved. And we'll talk about that. We have a whole section to, to talk about that as well, some of the changes and why they matter and, and what the model really looks like and actually comparing and we ran um, a plan or two to show you kind of what how it's improved and how, how the, the results may look different. And also, this is the first time in, in the current generation of, of geopath measurement that scheduled fleet and transit will, will be available. And that's a really big deal for us. Again, this, this falls under um, our strategic vision that we've been talking about over the last year of being able to have more inventory and kind of own the map of the out-of-home world, so to speak, right? So, so that there's more available and more audited within Geopath. And again, right now, uh, if, you're, if you log into the, the Insight Suite, you'll see there's about almost 1.5 million spots that we're, we're auditing, cut and broken across you know, about a half a million roadside units. Um, you know, we have 120 scheduled, uh, roughly 120 scheduled fleet, a half a million, again, units there, and another 26,000 more in, in terms of transit station media. So again, really trying to focus on our overall strategic vision and, and this really falls in line with it. And we're really excited about it and hopefully you've been able to, to start using the, um, the available inventory in there. A couple questions, FAQ type questions we, you, you may have. Again, this is these are in the FAQ document as well. Uh, just about every, as an aside, just about every slide in here is represented somewhere in that support materials. So you should be able to find the, all the same data elsewhere as well. Um, 
So which audiences? So we launched on the 27th with 100 plus unique demographic audiences and all the prison premier audiences. So they're, they're a total of 68. And we intend to, um, within the next monthly release on March 27th, start adding to that. So we know through some of the geek out questions we've been getting, we, we definitely need to expand some of the additional demographic segments um, that, that were not there. Again, all this, the, the initial release was based on historical usage. So we had to kind of make a kind of a cutoff. And then from there, we'll, we'll continue to, to be adding. So if there's a particular segment uh, specifically around demographics that your organization uses a lot and you're not finding, definitely reach out to us on Geek Out. We want to make sure we're, we're, we're trying to um, accommodate as much of those audiences as, as possible. Again, not that everyone may get in by the 27th. And again, it'll be a rolling release as more and more audiences get added. But starting on March 27th is the initial, initial goal. Um, also, this one's important. Um, hopefully, you're all aware of this already, but I just felt it was worth um, re worth reiterating. So, when can I start using the forecast? So, you can start using it immediately. So, released on the 27th uh, in the Insight Suite as well as the API version 2.2. That's where the only place in with the API environment that you can get the 2023 forecast. So, you should be accessing that in terms of your API endpoints. And um, you can, as it says here, you can start using it for transactional purposes immediately. Again, some organizations may choose not to because as we talked about in the last webinar and also our communication, we'll have this adoption period, so to speak. We know certain organizations need time to get this data into their platforms. They need time to build packages around transit inventory and things like that. So we wanna make sure we're accommodating the industry with that. So ultimate goal is by April 3rd, having everybody you know, using this as the transactional data set. Again, in that interim, and this is always good practice anyway, make sure you are disclosing or actually confirming what data vintage the, the um, reports you're getting are. So again, any export from the Insight Suite will have that. It'll tell you data source 2023 or, or the R1, which is the mid-year mid forecast, which kind of leads to the next slide. Um, where can I get it and what forecasts are still available? So. Again, if you're in the API, you know, you, you're you using version 2.2, but if you're pulling the data from the Insight Suite, um, again, and Brian will show you this in a second, um, you want to go to the data source and pick January 2023 to December 2023, and um, that will automatically, the next time you log in, that will kind of set your default for that. But if, again, if you haven't logged in since uh, since the, the, the current release, you may, it may still be pulling the mid-year forecast. So you want, you want to make sure you go in and pick that data source. Um, and again, 2021 mid-year forecast will be available and remain available throughout, uh, throughout next year. I'm sorry, throughout the end of this year, rather. Um, one thing to note is, you know, things like the new reach model aren't available with the 2021 forecast. New inventory that gets added throughout the year won't be added to that, as well as um, um, you know it, it is the the old forecast. So just one those those two things I, I wanted to make make note of. A couple of things that to as you're working with the data, things to consider. Um, some things we're still kind of uh, focusing on as as we kind of get into March March 27th and get towards that April 3rd date. Um, so. Output from the Insight Suite and, and the API are, are an estimate of audience delivery, right? So as you're building your, you know, your plans, pulling in inventory, pulling out inventory, um, the, the reach and frequency, you may see a little fluctuation. So it may not feel as much like a straight line going up. We're working on that and making sure it's just smooth out. There's nothing wrong with it. It is functioning how the model should function. It just, you know, you may have questions on that as you're, as you're going through. Just want to make note of that. But again, if you do have any concerns, always reach out to Geek Out. You know, if you're seeing something that you feel like, is this right or is this wonky, email us. We're, we're happy to, to answer those questions. Also, some media may still be showing up as 
uh, under review or we've been asked by the media operator to suppress it as they're looking at it. And so again, that's all getting worked out over the last couple of weeks, more and more inventory uh, is coming into the system. Not that there was much under the, with this, but any, any of the remaining under review is, is starting to kind of get through the system. Um, API users, if, if go to the developer portal, there's a lot of documentation there. Um, so uh, I put the put the email uh, the URL there api docsgeopathorg So there's additional documentation there as well. If you do have any questions or have any um, you know breaking you know breaking changes, I guess the term is um, it, it will be noted there. Um, so additional questions: where to go for additional help? Um, Kind of tried to set this up as like if this then that obviously so again if you're a media operator and you, you're not seeing some measures for your place-based inventory in the insight suite or in the api or you know you may be looking at some units and you may see something deviating from what you consider quote unquote, deviating significantly from the previous forecast definitely reach out to us again obviously you can always as i said reach out to geek out but probably quicker to reach out to the um, media operations team. So your analyst that that's typically assigned to you. But again, if you do email geek out directly, we'll make sure that you, you get to that, that person. Um, other things like similarly, maybe if you're um, an agency person creating a plan and you, you see it on the map, but you're not getting measures, which is kind of the, the reverse issue with uh, from the question above, or you're not finding a demographic audience that you need. Again, email us at Geek Out. We're also always, and this is in general, not just specifically with the, the annual forecast, but if you want any custom training, again, we're happy to, to do that. And when I say email geek out at geopath.org, you're essentially emailing Brian and myself. So, so uh, we're the ones monitoring that and making sure everybody's answers get, uh, questions get answered. So uh, so just just so you know. Um, again, hopefully today we'll, we'll help this last one uh, if you need help with um, how do you, how do you, how to work with the transit station schedule fleet media? We know it's different. Um, it's the first time, like we said, in, in a while we've had this kind of inventory. Um, so geek out library is where the tutorials are. Uh, learning lab, you know, we're going to drop those into the, the video tutorials and user guides into the the courses there. Um, but probably if you've already been, been through the learning lab, it's probably most easiest to just go to geek out library. Again, or I know I keep repeating myself, uh, you can email us at geekout at geopath.org. So um, um, a couple, I mean, maybe I, Brian, I can address these couple of questions I'm seeing coming up right now. Sure. Um, will there be a mid-year 2023 release? Um, at this point, um, we're not necessarily planning on it. Oh, long-term, our goal is to have more frequent releases. But again, as far as I know, right now we're not necessarily planning on a mid-year mid-year release at this point. Um, and will top airports be audited this year? Um, you know, again, that is a lot of times based on our, our the the member we're working with and how that uh, goes through the system. So um, I think the goal is yes, and I do believe some of the airports are in there, but I could be mis misspeaking. So I do apologize if I'm uh, if I'm misspeaking on that. But yes, that that is the goal to have the top airports in there in there this year, uh, if they aren't already. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Brian. I mean, I'll, you know, he'll he's going to talk a little bit more about this, but I'll probably jump in here and there as well. Yep, sounds good. So uh, Scott, could you head to the next slide? So yep. one of the one of the big things going into the uh, 2023 forecast, and you've heard us talk about it a few times is this updated reach and frequency approach and the updated reach and frequency model. Um, there are a couple of key things that I just want to highlight just so people have some good talking points on how to discuss this with clients and things like that. Um, before we really get into it, there were kind of two main use cases as sort of the whole basis why we redid the reach and frequency model. At, at a very high level, um, one instance was you'd have a plan where the reach for the entire plan was basically capping out at the same reach as a single unit and additional additional units added to that plan weren't increasing reach as they should have were just increasing frequency 
Um, the other the other sort of side of that, the other use case that we were seeing was packages, particularly for things like uh, transit station, or sorry, not transit station, uh, like transit shelters, bus benches, um, sort of street furniture level things. You'd see packages where there'd be a very low reach, but a very high frequency. So those were kind of the two main things that we were considering as things we wanted to address and, and sort of adjust for going into the new approach. Um, so a couple key things to, to make note of here. Um, the biggest change here, th there's a couple key ways that this has changed, but one of the biggest changes on the input side is that now we're utilizing uh, both observed reach and frequency data now. In the 2021-06 forecast, there was observed frequency data, but going into this new 2023 forecast and revitalizing the reach and frequency model, we started using observed reach data as well. Um, so that has been really useful for us. And that basically provides, you can see here, provides sort of a ground truth or a truth set for us. Um, we're able to know how people's devices move over time within a market. And then that helps us understand the way that audience coverage and duplication build. And those are kind of the two, uh, two pieces within the actual model that have really changed. Um, so on this side here, and like Scott said at the beginning, we've got one pagers and documentation that sort of address all of this in more detail. Um, this graphic that you can see here, this is actually pulled right from an example about coverage and duplication. Um, one of the key things that I want to cover here or wanted to bring up, um, and of course this is true um, just kind of logically, but not every board is going to reach every person within your target market, um, within your target audience for that matter. And so this illustration that we have here on the bottom, and again, this references back to a, to a user guide or to a, to a one pager, but this basically just kind of shows the way that reach builds across a package as you add in more spots and more units within that package. So, you know, even though there is reach from it, for example, looking at the, the one on the left unit A in the top right or top left, you know, there, even though there is reach across, uh, so unit C, for example, also reaches the same audience that unit A is reaching, but when you combine them, it's not a straight addition. And that's a big part of the model to remember and just kind of reach and frequency in general that Reach and frequency include duplication, or reach includes duplication in frequency. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. No, you can. So I basically the the whole point of this of this model here, or of this uh, illustration here, is just to show how reach and frequency build as you increase the amount of units in a package. Um, and how different pockets of the audience are reached by the same unit, but it adds up in different ways. And so that's kind of what this visual explains here. On the next slide here, so this is a really useful uh, just kind of visual comparison. On the left side, that 2021 V1 model there, um, that's comparing the reach that was coming out of that forecast with the observed reach data that we were seeing. And you can see there's there is a bit of a correlation there, but it's not a very tight correlation. On the right side, that's the correlation of the modeled reach and the observed reach aligned with each other there. And you can see a significantly tighter correlation when we're looking at observed. Again, that truth set that um, that ground truth of observed reach data that we've been looking at. Yeah, and this is this always is one of Dylan's favorite slides, you know, because again, the left side, again, you don't even I don't. Feel like you have to be a mathematician to know that like that that looks you know a little messy whereas the right side is it's pretty tight and has that pattern that 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 we 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 want to start seeing and um, um I think on the next slide you know there's a question in there like roughly kind of what are we seeing in terms of the mm -hmm. so I think there's a, a really good example here and again yes. yeah I mean I don't know if you I want to talk about it, Brian. And yeah, it. sure. Under. Yeah, so this was actually, I I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this was one of the packages that we used as sort of our um, test packages and training packages for this um, remodeling exercise. So you can see it's it's a package of 56. Uh, it's a mix of bulletins and posters in the Los Angeles DMA, persons 18 plus, eight weeks, fairly straightforward. Um, and if you look on the right side in that box there, the package was getting about a 14 point 
14.4% reach if you round it, and about a 41, 41.8, about 42 frequency, very high frequency comparatively. Um, if you look at the same package run against the same parameters using the 2023 model, you can see we're getting about a 68, almost a 69% reach, so 68.65, and then a frequency of 9.2. It It's hard to sort of quantify, quantify something like feel or sort of just kind of intuition, it, it it feels a lot more realistic looking at a reach like that for a package of this size, sort of in this kind of market for this long. Something like a 68.65% reach makes a lot more sense than a 14.36. Um, and so this is kind of a good example of some of the shifts that we're seeing when looking at the package level reach and frequency. Sure. I think another thing to, to think about too, as you're looking at this is the, the in-market impressions, right? They're, they're very close to each other as well. So again, starting to speak to the, the precision and the, the, you know, of, and the granularity of, of the model itself, right? So the, there's definitely a little bit of um, uh, increase in, in impressions in the overall plan. But again, pretty, pretty, fairly close, right? But the reach is, is very different. So we definitely are seeing that. Not that every single package is going to be, you know, higher in reach, but again, I think more again to not to want to use feelings, but again, you know, it it is I think a little bit more um reasonable metrics coming out of it that people will feel more comfortable in and confident using with their with their clients. So. Right. And if nothing else, more sensitive to the overlap of audience and duplication as a package builds. Yeah, right. Um, cool. So we want to talk about transit station and schedule fleet media, and then we'll we'll jump into the tool for a little bit. Um, so again, this is definitely this is a one page for sure that we that we have available that's downloadable in the packet. And we have versions of this now for our roadside inventory as well, a place base, and, and you'll see another one coming up for schedule fleet. But again, really just trying to at a high level talk about kind of how, what our approach to, to measurement is here. And the thing that's interesting is if I had the roadside one up and maybe I should have uh, as well, the, there's a lot of similar steps that are happening, right? So if you, the, the, this idea of really needing to understand household level population data. So using that data to understand neighborhoods, so to speak, right? And the people that live in these areas, the demographics, their consumer behaviors, their attitudes, and all those, those aspects, right? So we, we need to understand the people, and then we need to understand using the mobile data, understand their movements, right? And that together we create this this uh, nationwide trip matrix of understanding people's the, the pathways, the volume, the frequency, their motivation for the, for their travels, and uh, you know almost simultaneously we're, we're doing both of those things. And then with with scheduled fleet in particular, there's this additional step of really because the inventory is moving, understanding the trips and the routes that these vehicles are taking again based on their GPS pings or their known travel pattern based on the stops, right? And so then we marry that together and connect those trip paths with the, with the media that's moving and really contextualize that. Again, applying the our dwell time and moving from an opportunity to see to likelihood to see based on the size and the angle and all of those other, other things. And that's ultimately how we come to kind of create the metrics. So what's changed from the last time and why, why does that matter? So a couple, again, this is a one pager with a little bit more detail on it than, than I have here, but a couple of the key things that I'll try to hit on and highlight are things like, um, so with, with routing. So previously when we were doing routing for scheduled fleet, it would be a straight line roughly as the crow flies versus the actual street network and being able to mimic that. So, so now the entire network, uh, the, the entire um, route that traveled is, is accounted for, right? And things like freeways are uh, able to be included, even if the, uh, the, the bus is traveling, not traveling on the freeway. So let's say it's traveling on an access road beside it. We're able to account for that audience seeing that bus from the freeway as well. Uh, GTF, GTFS data um, also has improved. We've also improved how we 
recognize the different roots that are taken and the different um, the the different um, functioning of, of a bus. We know not every bus runs every day, and weekday schedules are different than weekend schedules, which are different than holiday schedules. So all of that is accounted for uh, in the new in the new measurement. And then in terms of circulation, again, we we definitely have much more granular availability of data, and this allows greater precision in doing that um, in terms of you know, understanding traffic uh, previously, um, traffic was accounted for in both directions, even in the situation where there was a split highway and that other traffic might not have been able to see it. So again, because of the granularity of the data, we're able to better understand that and better account for situations like that. Um, also now all four sides of the vehicle can now have, um, you know, we'll now have um, metrics. So again, they all have their own ratings in terms of headlight, taillights, passenger side, driver side. So we're able to break that out. And then impressions for, for wrap vehicles, wrap media types are, are also available. So these are all different improvements for and different changes related to, to schedule. Um, and then just quickly talking about transit and our approach there and then like I said, we'll, we'll jump into the tool and start walking you through some, some examples of, of what's there. So this in particular, again, similarly, we have to understand circulation uh, of the venue, but again, we're, we're understanding that through using the mobile data that we have, but also things like ridership reports, uh, football surveys, what any data that we have that can help inform that and make the data smarter, we're trying to leverage. Um, and so, so again, we need to understand that as well as the, the circulation of, of the venue. We use that data to help inform, inform the, the circulation within the venue. And then um, we know that not every person who enters the venue has the same opportunity to see depending on where the frame is located, depending on where they're entering or exiting and what is there and how many platforms or concourses there are. So there's all these different different factors that go into understanding the frame circulation. So the people actually passing by any particular frame. And then again, looking at trying to connect these visits using our visibility adjustment um, and understanding kind of where people's opportunity to see and moving them into likelihood to see. So again, we need to understand the circulation of the venue, people coming in, where they're moving within the venue and how that's in relation to the, the inventory in there and then applying factors like, you know, the dwell time as well as the, the, the frame attributes as well to it. I'll talk a little bit more deeply about that here, but again, similarly, there's a one pager on this uh, available for, for our non So um, one, of the, some, one of the things that really changed um, are a couple of things in relation to placement type and structure type are, are really important, I think, uh, exciting for, for everybody using this type of type of media. You know, previously we were limited to just like platform and, and concourse uh, media types or placement types, and we had an average station number. But now we're able to add, you know, different different placement types, such as exit entrance or elevator or, you know, open floors or uh, fare machine. So there's a whole host of additional placement types that we're able to to account for, and you know, the attributes of the inventory kind of are based on on the the frames environment, right, and the exposure and likelihood. Uh, for for the area itself can, is as accounted for and, and able to be reported, um, and then in terms of structure types, and I'll talk about the structure types in relation to dwell time as well because they they kind of go together. So we can now for calculate for various um, uh, inventory across different structure types. So previously, things like ceilings or columns or furniture within the station. We're not we're not accounted for because they didn't fit into our uh, standard structure, uh, you know, standard type. But now they're able to be accounted for, and depending on the structure type, again, 
is dependent on, you know, the, the dwell time plays a factor because of a certain structure type. Its goal is to maybe meet people as they're walking down the, the concourse. So they might have more passing dwell time versus extended dwell time. Where, for example, it's a piece of, you know, a furniture that you might be sitting on. And so they might be in a waiting room or things like that. So you start to have that ex the extended dwell time. So these the, the, they play a role with each other. And then in terms of venue circulation, previously we were only able to leverage ridership data, but now because we have access to all this mobile data, we're able to really account for all audience and the purpose and the reason that they're there for. So for example, you know, I, I used to work at Two Penn Plaza just down the road a little bit for a lot of years, right? And that's above Penn Station. I might go down there for lunch, right? I'm not accounted for ridership, but I might go grab a slice of pizza for lunch. I'm still seeing the inventory. So now I'm accounted for in that where previously I might not have been. So that's a, a one example of how that, that's improved. And again, in terms of a venue layout, um, the number of uh, platforms and concourses are now accounted for. So we have a better understanding of the venue itself within the structure itself, how many floors there are and where inventory is. So that is also accounted for more, more in a more refined way. So um, I am going to hand it off. I'll check some of the questions and maybe we'll come back and either answer them or try to answer them directly as Brian's going through and um, going to um, take us through the session so perfect awesome can you see my screen scott yes awesome okay so uh for anyone who was on the the webinar about a week and a half ago um i i flew through some of this just for sake of time so i want to revisit a couple things i talked about there just point out some really important things that i think are useful to know with the new forecast um and then I'll just put together a couple different examples, show you how to actually make some plans and how to use this. So one major thing right off the bat, um, like Scott said, you may not have the 2023 forecast automatically selected. I think most people should at this point, but um, if you come in here and say it's still set to the 202106, you can just hit this data source drop down and switch to 2023. So if you're looking for the 2023 data set, that's how you access it. And just to reiterate, the 2023 forecast is the only place you can see scheduled fleet inventory with measures, um, the new region frequency model, um, most of the transit station, some of it, I believe, was in here in 2026. But for the most part, um, that's only viewable in the 2023 forecast. So. For basically everything we've been talking about today, you'll want to go double check it's set to the 2023 forecast. A um, couple other things that are different given the new data release here. If you go to the filter inventory tab and you're looking at operators, you may notice that this looks and functions slightly differently now. Um, before it was just one list sort of within this operators filter, but we now have the organizations and division names. Um, the organizations are really useful for selecting like if you're if you're doing roadside, for example, and you want to look at, you know, Lamar or intersection or whoever's, you know, just their inventory, sort of looking at this as the operator filter as you had been using it, you can use it that way. But it's also really useful if you're trying to filter for all of the inventory of a specific transit authority, for example, like the MTA or New Jersey Transit. When you switch over to the division name side, it gets much more specific. And that lets me select things like say, for example, New Jersey Transit is, is uh, managed by intersections, so I can select that here. Or if you're looking for, I don't know, Chicago. So the Chicago Transit Authority. Um, but what this also does, in addition to just kind of selecting specific transit lines or sort of subsystems within the system, um, this will allow you to select roadside inventory within certain divisions regionally, which is just a handy thing to be able to do as well. But um, the division name again, more specific organizations, a little bit more overarching. But I uh, just wanted to point that out. And you'll see kind of as I go through and as I build my example today, you'll see how that kind of comes into play. Um, so one of the other things that I want to point out that will be really useful in the media and placement filter. Um, some of you may know this as well, but in the media class filter, you can select roadside, scheduled fleet or place based. Um, and just as a little bit of additional context, 
Place-based is where you'll find anything transit station, but it's also to the question we came that came up earlier. Place-based is where you find anything airport, anything that's in venue or anything that has, uh, I should say, anything that has inventory that's within a venue is considered place-based. So transit stations, airports, that's all within there. Um, kind of to that end, these three filters here at the bottom can be really useful when you're starting to use either place-based inventory such as transit station or scheduled fleet bus advertising. Um, in particular, I wanna point out the place name. And you'll see again, as I do an example, you'll see how this comes together. But say someone is looking for buses coming out of only a single garage, you can use the place name to filter for just inventory within that garage. Um, I don't have one off the top of my head as an example, but I'll, if we just search garage, you'll see what I mean. There's all of these different specific garages. Um, and as I go and as I kind of build my scenario, you'll see how garages play into it. Um, but generally speaking, different garages service different areas of the market and therefore kind of reaching different pockets of audience. So being able to, to plan on a specific garage might help you regionally reach a certain set of people, but it's just something to be able to know how to do if you're trying to buy from a specific garage or just plan on one garage or, or multiple garages. Um, again, that'll all come up when I when I do my example. I just wanted to show everyone kind of where that can be uh, used. Oh, and also to Scott's point earlier, placement type is really useful if you are trying to, like say you're in a transit station, you're looking for column or I think column or ceiling, I know is one. So vehicle interior ceiling or um, place type. So there, it's just useful to be able to sort of uh, select different types of venues, different places within the venue that you're looking at your inventory. Um, just some useful things that might not come up in roadside if you've only really used this for roadside before. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, so really quick, I'm just going to start to set up an example here. Um, I want to look in the Chicago DMA. And I'm going to also filter just to scheduled fleet. So again, I mentioned you can use this media class filter to do that. So I'm going to select go fleet exterior scheduled and just for good measure this is a little bit of a helpful tip but if you go down to the media attributes and audit status i'm also going to just select measured so i make sure i'm only looking at things that currently have measures in the system because to scott's point there are some in here that may be currently suppressed may still be under review just for the sake of kind of cleaning up my filters it's a little bit easier to look at just the measured inventory so the other thing I wanted to look at as well, um, and I'll, I'll show this once this pulls up, I'm going to look at just a specific type of bus advertising because I just want to look at um, maybe one, maybe two different types of bus ads, but I'll show you how you can sort of do that with some of the filters here. And you'll notice as well, and I'll, I'll kind of point this out when I'm, when I'm looking at the table view, looking a little bit more in depth, um, spot IDs and kind of the way that individual representations of, of units are, they're handled a little bit differently for scheduled fleet. So just some talking points around that I'll bring up as well. So I'm just gonna go back over here to the median placement filter and I wanted to pull up this operator media name list. Um, so this is a nice, really handy way, especially if you're looking at scheduled fleet media, this is a nice easy way to pull up just advertisements of a specific type. So like if I were looking for just Kings or just taillight displays, um, in this example, I was just going to use full back display, so like the entire back side of the bus. Um, but you can select one or multiple and then filter for that. Um, just for the sake of our example today, I'll just look at full backs in the Chicago market here. Um, and just to kind of illustrate what I was talking about a little bit earlier, if I go down to the operators and I switch over to division, you can see the different people that are operating scheduled fleet in this market. So uh, Intersection is managing the Chicago Transit Authority, Outselling has got the Pace Suburban Bus Service. Um, so there's two different systems, two different lines basically within here, not necessarily lines, two different systems that I can utilize when I'm building my plans here. Um, so I'll just zoom in. And you'll notice as well on the map that they display a little bit differently than roadside does. This is representing the garage locations. Um, again, kind of to my point, different garages service different areas of the market. So something to, to take into consideration when building packages. Um, let me open up this view down here and take a look at this a little bit more closely. It's I, I find it a little bit easier to sort of parse through the data when I'm looking at the spot list down here. 
Um, so one thing I wanted to point out, and I think this is a useful tip, just if you're going to be planning or using a uh, scheduled fleet here, um, there's some columns that I recommend adding to your view that might not be here. Um, so this is basically uh, the same thing as the organization and division filter. You can see organization own and manage. Same kind of data here, just represented a little bit differently. Um, but some of the key things that I would recommend adding, um, place name as a column will be really helpful. As you can see, this will tell me which bus or which garage specifically I'm looking at. So 103rd garage, uh, Kedzie, uh, Chicago bus garage, 77th. So that's really useful to know. And all that's found in place name. Placement type this doesn't really apply here because I'm looking at full back. So if I were looking at like a king, which is side dependent, the placement type would show you driver side or passenger side. So something to be uh, aware of as well. Um, and I also recommend adding um, the units selected in max units. And I mentioned kind of very briefly that Geopath spot IDs function a little bit differently for scheduled fleet than they do for something like roadside. So take, for example, um, this fullback coming out of this North Park bus garage. So intersections, this is intersection inventory from the Chicago Transit Authority. Um, I know I'm looking at full back and I know that it's from within this garage. And so in this instance, there's actually just one spot ID showing. With scheduled fleet, any difference in the garage selection, the media type itself, uh, the placement, like left side, right side of the of the uh, of the ad, the bus size, I may have said that, but the size in feet, any variation in any of those things will result in a different spot ID. So for example, you can see this spot ID right here. There are 61 units of this exact type from within this garage. So I know that there are 61 fullbacks from this North Park garage, and there are four from this 103rd Street garage. So just some useful things to keep in mind as you're going through and saying like, okay, I can I can buy you know five of these, I can buy 10 of these, but just kind of knowing what the max units are is a useful thing to keep in mind. Um, so just for example's sake, I'm going to set some units aside that I want to use later for, for um, an inventory plan. Just something that you might do sort of after you've already, like at the back end of your project, after you've done all your planning, if you want to go and look at specific units or specific ad types and different amounts of that as an inventory plan, you can do that. I'm just going to select a few here so I have options for my inventory plan later. Um, and you'll notice actually, if you go and you select it's showing 307 selected, even though I selected four. It's selecting the count of the max units in that sort of list of spots. You'll you'll see once I put this all together, not super important right now, but um, okay. So I'm just going to set those aside to my account. Um, but basically, certain things might be useful in here to, to sort of take note of before you head over to Workspace. Uh, just in our conversations with members sort of preparing for this release, and just uh, since the release for that matter as well, we've gotten a lot of feedback about how a lot of packages and a lot of the sort of planning and selling process will likely be done using market plan as opposed to inventory plan, or uh, at least sort of using market plan to uh, to build packages and to sort of section things off into packages. Um, so a couple things that might be useful to know about as you're going and building packages, again, knowing the garage name, just kind of knowing which garages exist within the system, that's always a useful thing to know if you're trying to plan on a specific garage. Um, and also just knowing the different um, the different media types within the, within the system. So um, I'm just going to head over to the market plan and show you how to put together or head over to workspace and show you how to put together a market plan here. So I'm going to uh, basically set this up with kind of the same thing I was just doing before. So I'm going to do 18 plus, which I, I didn't really add before, but um, so DMA again, Chicago DMA. So I could select a specific operator and just like with Explorer, you'll notice there's now the organizations and the divisions filter. Same way, it functions the same way here as it does in Explore. Um, I'm going to leave this blank. Like if you're trying to plan across all of the inventory in a market, like same, same for how you do a roadside, you can just plan across all of that inventory in a market, or you can plan to a specific operator or division. For, for our example today, I'm just going to leave this blank so I can look at all of the fullbacks in the, in the market. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to recommend when you're doing your um, market plan selections, it's helpful to be as specific as possible when you're adding your media. So 
in median placement, you'll need to select from this media class. I, th I think it's almost, it, it does kind of prompt you. I think it's a, a bit of a requirement here, but I always recommend starting with your media class. And these filters will stay on as you go through and add other filters. So just kind of be aware of that. You'll see as, as, as I add this up, what I mean here. But so I've got fleet exterior scheduled selected. And if you go to operator media name, I can see all of the different media types. And again, this is including um, both roadside digital and place based right here. It's not, it hasn't auto updated. But I'm looking for pullbacks in this in this example. So I'll select that. Um, and then I can hit add selected here. Now, say for example, I wanted to look at inventory only coming from within a particular garage. If I wanted to do that kind of thing, and again, I mentioned that these are still selected, even though I've added my inventory down here. So these are still selected. I can go to my place name and say, for example, like one of the garages I know was called Forest Glen. So I search that. There we go. So say I wanted to add this, this would then only be looking at fullbacks from within this Forest Glen bus garage. So if you're trying to plan on a specific garage or just on inventory from one garage or from multiple for that matter, you can do that by adding in a specific garage from the place name. Uh, I'm just going to plan across the entire system, just kind of looking at fullbacks across everything. So I'm going to hit apply selections. Um, and then I'm just going to make this a four week plan. And let's say this is 100 TRPs I'm trying to reach. So I'll just hit generate now. Um, while this is running, Scott, were there any? Oh, that was fast. Never mind. I was going to see if there are any questions, but we can revisit. So let me open this up. Um, so because I didn't specify the operator, had I specified an operator or a division for that matter, um, it would have shown me just the inventory of that one operator, just, just like with roadside. Um, because I planned across all of the inventory in the market, I can see when I open this up, the counts of the different uh, inventory of this type that each of the operators have. So if you're trying to be more specific and just look at inventory of one operator or one division, that will affect how this plans out. But basically, this is taking my 100 TRPs, and it's kind of spreading it across all of the fullbacks in this market. So it's saying I would need about 112 to get this kind of delivery. And so you can see sort of my reach and my frequency, um, the reach net, so the unique number of different people of our target audience that have been reached. Um, and so you can actually go and edit these amounts either on the TRP amount, the spot amount itself, or the reach percent. So you can edit any of those and kind of fine tune your plan a little bit. Like say, for example, you wanted to see, okay, what would 100 full, full backs look like instead? And then this will just rerun based on that new goal. So that would get me about a 90 TRP, about a 21% reach, similar frequency. But um, so you can just kind of go through and update your plans that way. Um, and again, in a lot of our conversations with some of the transit operators, it, it seems that a lot of people will be building packages and sort of going about their work with scheduled fleet using this kind of method. So just a couple of things that I, that I wanted to show. Again, if you're trying to plan a specific garage, you can do that when you're adding your media. Um, you can plan it to a specific operator or division, or you can look across an entire market. Um, I'm going to really quickly just show, say, for example, someone is doing a plan like this, and they also wanted to add some transit station interior media. Um, so let me add a new plan here. And I'm going to set it up very similarly. But um, basically, the whole point I'm trying to show here and just kind of illustrate is that roadside schedule fleet and place-based all function very similarly to each other within this sort of scope here. So you can put them all in a similar plan, all within one plan and plan across different media classes. So um, operators, again, I'm going to leave open median placement. Um, and you'll notice this is where the sort of specific selections really come into play. So fleet exterior scheduled. I'm going to, again, do full back. So I'll add that. And then I'm going to come up here. I'll deselect very important, deselect whatever you have selected. Come back up here, I'll switch this to place-based, and then I'm gonna look for two sheets. Two sheet. Okay, so you can see down here, I've got fleet exterior scheduled, full back, place-based, two sheet. I could add roadside if I wanted to. Um, you can add many, many different media types into your plan, but just for example's sake. And again, I'll do four weeks and I'll do 100 TRPs again. Generate that. OK, 
Okay. Now, I, I do realize we're coming up close on time. So the last thing I'm going to show is just how to do an inventory plan with those couple things I set aside. Um, so again, it splits your TRP goal across. So 50 for the fullbacks, it would take me about 57 fullbacks, about 91 two sheets. And you can see the delivery, the sort of estimate of delivery across each of these different media types and as the package as a whole. And just like before, I can edit any of these amounts. Um, so real quick, I'm going to head over here and I'm just going to make a quick inventory plan. Um, again, just like with roadside functions, very similarly. So I'm going to go to my inventory selection first, actually, and I'm going to pull in the inventory set I just saved. So Chicago fleet example, I'm going to add my, uh, add my individual DMA. So same thing as before, I'm going to do 18 plus. And I basically just want to show how, if you are selecting specific units or specific uh, IDs and you want to add like, I want to buy 10 of this type of fallback, how you would do that kind of thing, how you'd look at that kind of metric. So Chicago, yes. Oh, it was already in there. I didn't need to do that. Um, 18 plus Chicago. Okay. So I'm just going to put this to four weeks and I'll hit generate. Um, while this is running, just take a second to sort of hop in on any questions. Um, if there, If there's anything Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, no, um, I think that there is one question, but it's very specific to media operators. So I'm going to, we'll reach out to to that person. So just so everything else we've been able to answer uh, directly or has been answered in the kind of context of, of, the, of the presentation so far. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and just to reiterate too, I know Scott mentioned this at the beginning. It doesn't hurt to say it again. There are plenty of support materials that we have set up. Um, I, I made user guides and video tutorials, largely echoing a lot of what I was doing here today. Um, there's one on planning by garage, one on planning by organization and division, one by just one about using scheduled fleet and explore module, and then one about transit station media. Um, so there's a video and a user guide for each of those, and then tons of different one pagers about reach and frequency and all that stuff. Let me open this up. It says it's still running, but um, we'll I'll, I'll keep an eye on time as as time permits. In the next couple minutes, I'll I'll show this. But if not, we <laughs> okay. Um, so is there anything? Just the results of this was the last thing you wanted. Yeah, that was the last thing I was going to do. All right. Um, if you don't, I can. We can come back to it. Yeah, I might um, just take over the, the screen now. Okay. And the last few slides. Oops, there we are. Um, just the last few slides of the presentation. Um, it, it just echoes what you were saying. Um, you know, if anybody that joined the session late, um, just what Brian was saying, we do have a host of things. I'm not going to repeat everything like I did up front, but um, you can go to the Geek Out Library. It's probably the easiest place to download it. Uh, this session, along with the other sessions, are always available in our Geek Out, li uh, Geek Out library, but also just on the Geek Out portion of our website, just go to Geek Out and scroll down to out of home office hours. This was the February 23rd session, as I said before, but uh, soon after you'll see this session available as well. Um, the other thing I want to make sure everybody's aware of, um, just as we're finishing up, the uh, conference is coming up. Hopefully everybody on the call today is, is heading there. And we will be doing two training sessions. We'll send out more information on these as well. But again, we'll do an even more deeper dive um, on this at the session. Brian and I will be there on March 27th at one o'clock at Rail Yard A. I hope that's not really a rail yard, but I think it's hopefully the name of the room. But I uh, will cover a lot of this stuff, but also much more in depth on commonly used metrics and measurement or measurement approach and, and things like that. So this will be uh, more of a holistic kind of everything, all things geopath. Uh, on, the, on the right side on Wednesday, right shortly after the conference ends at 1 p.m., we'll also be doing a, another session, just create, again, using data to create winning plans. If anybody was there last year, it's very similar to what we did. Um, we have a panel, uh, Piper Worth from uh, Rapport, Heather Hader from Yesco, as well as Andy Marcus from Clear Channel. We're, we're creating a real life scenario. We have a company and you know you get that phone call. What are the questions you have? Well, how do you get the information you need? Who do you reach out to? Um, so it's really just walking the whole process, walking through the whole process, different data, not beyond just geopath data. What are other resources you can use 
to, um, to, to, to answer these questions. Last year was a really great session. There's a lot of interaction with the audience and the panel, and it was really more about how does everybody help each other? And that's what we want to make this one again. So if you're there, I would encourage everybody to come to both, and in particular that one. So um, Brian, is anything else? Again, want to thank everybody for attending. I know we're hitting the top of the hour. So um, did you, was your report done running? And did you want to share it or are we still going on it? Uh, it's still running. I tried to run a single spot ID as sort of a second one, um, but that one's running as well. So I, Okay. It, for, for anyone who is looking for that kind of thing, I believe that I do an inventory plan example in at least one of those training videos. So um, you can you can find some more information there. I'm sorry I was not able to get that to, to run in time today. but Okay, no worries. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you, Brian. And again, uh, we want to, like I said early on in the beginning, we want to make sure everybody's feeling comfortable with the release and all the changes. We know a lot changed in terms of the forecast, the reach frequency, and the new inventory. Again, reach out to us at Geek Out if you need anything. We're, we're always happy to help. So um, thank you again. And uh, hopefully we'll see everybody at the conference, if not sooner. All right. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Cheers.